Well, well ladies and gentlemen, can I say what a pleasure it is to be here at the Google Big Tent uh, event? I think my kids would be delighted to know that I'm coming after the killer robots uh, and before the captain of the moonshots. I think they might be more interested in both of those than in uh, my presentation today. I, I, want, to, uh, I want to start, uh, as they say uh, on Have I Got News For You, uh, with four pictures. And I want to ask you who you think the odd one out is. And hopefully this is going to work. The first picture is my dad. His name was Ralph Miliband. Uh, he was a Marxist professor. The second picture is of Willy Wonka. Uh, famous uh, from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You'll remember the story, or maybe uh, you won't, that Willy Wonka gave away the Chocolate Factory to Charlie uh, and his family at the end of the book. I'm sorry if I spoiled the ending uh, <laughs> for you. The third, uh, she's been uh, quite prominent in the last few days, I think it's fair to say, uh, Margaret Hodge. Uh, she's the chair of the Public Accounts uh, Committee and has been quite critical uh, of Google. Uh, and then the fourth is Google itself and its founding slogan, don't be evil. So let's have a show of hands, shall we? Uh, who thinks my dad is the odd one out? Almost nobody, in fact, nobody. Uh, who thinks uh, Willy Wonka is the odd one out? Nope. Who thinks Margaret Hodge is the odd one out? Uh, few people think she's the odd one out. Uh, and who thinks Google, don't be evil, is the odd one out? Uh, most people, there are quite a lot of people who don't know, I think. Uh, okay, so you're all wrong, basically. My dad is the odd one out. And here's why my dad is the odd one out. He was a Marxist professor. He thought that the route to a fair society was through socialism based on public ownership. And it's not just he that thought it. The Labour Party used to think it too. And hopefully the next slide is going to show this. This was the Labour Party's constitution, Clause 4 and I'll read it to you, to secure for the workers, by hand or by brain, the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry or service. In other words, it was about nationalizing the commanding heights of our economy. Tony Blair rightly got rid of that in 1995 but he said that isn't the route to a fair society. Don't confuse public ownership with fairness. Now, the question then is for politics, and the question for my presence at this event today, is if capitalism is here to stay, are there any choices left to us? If it's not capitalism versus old-fashioned socialism anymore, well, is it just capitalism? And my answer to that is no, and I want to explain why. I'm going to show you four more pictures, but I'm not going to ask you to guess this time. The first picture, you won't have heard of this chap. His name is Richard O'Neill. He runs a small cleaning company in Islington. I met him a few months ago at an event for the living wage. Richard O'Neill and school office services, in the most competitive business that there is, pays a living wage to his employees. And Richard is incredibly proud, and rightly so, uh, of the fact that he does that. The second picture, and many of you will know him, is Muhammad Yunus, the microfinance genius uh, who has helped millions of people around the world start their own businesses uh, and prosper. Third picture is of Charlie Mayfield. Uh, he runs uh, John Lewis, Britain's biggest employee-owned firm. And then the fourth picture, and you'll have heard of this person, is Montgomery Burns. Uh, he, uh, he, he owns, for those of you who don't watch The Simpsons, uh, he owns the uh, nuclear power plant in The Simpsons. And I think it's fair to say he's not a really very good guy, but he leaves the radioactivity uh, lying around. Now, Montgomery Burns, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, not just because you did so badly the first time round, uh, but because it's, the answer is fairly obvious. Montgomery Burns is clearly the odd one out. Uh, he's not a responsible capitalist uh, like the others. Now, you might say, well, look, Montgomery Burns is a cartoon character. I could have put up some other examples, the Royal Bank of Scotland, for example, uh, before the financial crisis. And that's my argument today. We do face a choice, a choice between an irresponsible capitalism where inequality grows, 
where power is concentrated in the hands of the few, and where we're just in it for ourselves for the fast buck, and a responsible capitalism, where businesses are making profits, but we also have a more equal society, where power is in the hands of the many and not just the few, and we all face up to our responsibilities to each other and to the world. That is the big choice we face in politics in this country, and I believe uh, elsewhere today. And what I want to do today is talk about how that argument applies to the internet and the digital economy. I've been making this argument as Labour leader for two years. Partly, the responsible capitalism is a fairer, nicer society. My argument is also this, that you're more likely to succeed as a country to create the wealth the country needs and to be a prosperous country with responsible and not irresponsible capitalism. And I want to develop that argument today. Now, let's talk about the internet in, in, this, uh, in this context. The immediate thought is the internet surely takes us to the more responsible, not the irresponsible capitalism. John Snow said in his introduction that I'm the MP for Doncaster North. Clearly, the internet opens up access to markets for micro-businesses in my own constituency, farmers in Africa, uh, in a way that couldn't have been dreamed of. So when it comes to opening up opportunity, the internet is clearly an incredibly powerful uh, and positive force. It breaks down old hierarchies. Just ask anybody in politics uh, or in the media about the way it does that. And clearly, it does something else. It connects people across the world, creates global communities. The people here know all that better than me. And Google's been at the forefront of this, not just a company, but a verb. From the search engine to Gmail to Google Glass, all of those things. And I pay tribute to what Google has done in being at the forefront of that revolution. But here's the thing. You're used to politicians coming along and saying, isn't the internet great? If that's all I've got to say, there's no point in me being here. If there are no big questions to resolve, then what's the point of politics? You should have an internet conference without any politicians. My case to you is that while the internet can take us to a more responsible capitalism, it can also take us to a more irresponsible one as well. It opens up access to markets, but the digital divide is something we all know about, and it can leave people and countries behind. It breaks down old hierarchies, but clearly it can create new vested interests, new powerful vested interests. And it's great that we connect people across a global community, but what if we just enable global footloose companies to not face up to their own responsibilities within a nation state. Those are big tensions, and big tensions that government's got to have a role in helping to resolve, government and governments around the world. And my case to you is that the rules that we set, the behavior we encourage, the culture we create will determine what future we have, the responsible capitalism or the irresponsible capitalism whether we have more Charlie Mayfields or more Montgomery Burnses. And that is the big question facing the world. Now, let me start with Britain. What can we do to make sure that we don't leave people behind and we aren't left behind uh, as a country? There are, I think, 2.3 million people in this country who don't have access to basic broadband. And there are millions of people and it's hard to believe this, who've never used the internet in Britain. Now, clearly, that's bad for them, because it excludes them, leaves them out. But it's not just bad for them, and that's my case. It's bad for the country as well. Because in those people are the designers, the inventors, the engineers of the future. We've got to turn that round. We've got to turn it round for their sake and for the sake of the country. But you know it's not just about access. It's about more than that. And this is part of what today is about. It's about putting creativity at the heart of what we do as a country. 
and in particular at the heart of our education system. I think Google is to be congratulated for handing out Raspberry Pi computers to schools all around Britain. It's all about encouraging kids to get into programming, understand the internet in a deep way. But we need to take that logic of putting creativity at the heart of our education system much, much further if we're not to fall behind as a country. And we are going in the wrong direction, not the right direction. Why do I say we're going in the wrong direction? Because over the last three years alone, the number of hours our young people are learning art, design, and technology has gone down by 15%. We've got a third fewer teachers being trained in those subjects. And it's for a simple reason. And the simple reason is this, which is that the government has downgraded the importance of those subjects. And I know this has been, there's been pressure from people in the internet industry around this issue. They've downgraded those subjects, uh, and they've said their EBAC doesn't include them. That is totally the wrong direction for our country to be heading in. Think of Sir Johnny Ive incredibly famous designer, uh, and what he's done at Apple, from the iMac to the iPod to the iPad. How did Johnny Ive get his first break? He got his first break because his dad was a design and technology teacher. And Christmas in the Ive household, the Christmas treat was spending a day in the design and technology classroom. If we take that logic to today, we don't just want our kids using Google and Facebook and YouTube. We want them designing the next wave of technology. So the first thing we've got to do as a country, and this is what a Labour government would do, is put creativity back at the heart of our curriculum and not downgrade creativity as this government is doing. The second thing we've got to do is we've got to take advantage of the opportunities the internet offers to transform our economy, but we've got to do it in the right way. Not so power just accumulates to a few big firms, but that we get the micro businesses, the small businesses, really benefiting from the opportunities the internet offers. Individual creators working with the public sector and global companies to design the next wave of technology. Now sometimes the private sector can stop the smaller firms being pushed aside by the larger firms. Take the example of what Google did when it provided Android open source to the world. That prevented the smartphone market from being monopolized by a particular company. That opened up opportunity for small firms. But there's a lot more we need to do, and it can't just be done by the private sector alone. The role for government is incredibly important in this. And one of the most exciting ideas around is around digital public space. The idea of open access. Think about Britain's great public institutions, the BBC, the British Library. Think about the opportunities that can create for people and for businesses. You know, the old idea of the British Library is that you go along to a dusty building uh, with a membership card and maybe you're going to get in if you've got a particular reason to be there. The new idea of the British Library, think about the opportunities that can offer us. But the public sector needs to learn the lesson about open access and needs to do more. We've also got to ensure there are proper financial returns to creativity. It's why getting the law right on intellectual property, on design, uh, on copywriting, on piracy, all of those things are incredibly important, starting with the bill that's going through Parliament. And then there's the issue of regulation. And I tread carefully in this area because I know it's incredibly complex. And at the same time, we've got to prevent monopoly and make sure we don't stifle innovation. We've put forward a proposal for a digital ombudsman. Why have we put that idea forward? To say that because of this complex industry, we need to have somebody assigned to the role of identifying anti-competitive practices as they emerge, which doesn't happen in Britain at the moment, advise government that can then work with the proper regulators, including uh, in Europe. We welcome your views uh, on that idea. But the thing I would say to you is this. The central insight is that if responsible capitalism is to work, then the opportunities can't be grabbed by a small number of large firms. 
It's got to be about a large number of small firms, and the public and private sector need to do the right things to make that happen. Responsible capitalism, though, also needs responsible companies. And I welcome very much the fact that Google's Big Ten allows us to discuss all the issues we face uh, as a country and indeed as a world. And that takes me to the issue of tax, which has been controversial in the last few days, not just for Google, but for Apple and Amazon. Look, the first and primary responsibility of government is to set the right laws. And I welcome the fact that Google called at the weekend for international tax reform. We're very clear about what the government should be going to the G8 meetings with. They should be arguing for country by country transparency. So we know how much tax is being paid and how much profit is being made. Country by country, company by company. We need to reform the rules on transfer pricing, the crazy rules, frankly, that allows companies to shift profits from one jurisdiction to another. And we've got to crack down on offshore tax havens. Now, we need to get agreement internationally. But I also say this. A Labour government would be willing to act on its own here at home if we don't get international agreement. The question then is this. Do the responsibilities of the company simply lie in obeying the letter of the law? My answer to that is no. And I'll tell you why my answer to that is no. And it's captured very well in a letter that Larry Page and Sergey Brin wrote alongside Google's prospectus in 2004. This is what they said. Don't be evil. We've all heard of that. We will be stronger in the long term. We will be better served as shareholders and in all other ways by a company that does good things for the world, even if we forego some short-term gains. This is an important aspect of our culture and is broadly shared in the company. So what do I take out of that? That a company and its employees expect it to do the right thing. That customers expect it to do the right thing. That as a society, we need to set the right examples from the top. That the reputation of British business, and indeed business generally, depends on the most prominent companies like Google doing the right thing. And one other thing. If we're to have the tax revenues to fund the employees, the infrastructure, the health service, the education system on which Google relies, Google needs to do the right thing. That's why I spoke out after the select committee last week. I can't be the only person in this room who feels deeply disappointed that a great company like Google, with great founding principles, should be reduced to arguing that even though it employs thousands of people here in Britain, makes billions of pounds in revenue here in Britain, it's fair that it should pay just a fraction of 1% of that in tax. Now, I'm sorry that Eric Schmidt isn't here this morning to hear me say this directly. But when Google does great things, I will praise you. But when Eric Schmidt says that its current approach to tax is just capitalism, I disagree. And when Google goes to extraordinary lengths to avoid paying its taxes, I say it's wrong. And it's not just me that says it. It's Google's founding principles. And it's crystal clear from them. So how do we create a responsible capitalism? With government doing the right thing and companies doing the right thing too. I think we can produce the responsible capitalism that we need as a society. A society that is more equal, not less. Where power is in the hands of the many and not just the few. And also, one where we face up to our responsibilities from the top to the bottom of society. I started with my dad and I want to end with my dad too. He was wrong about public ownership of the means of production. 
but he was right about something else. He came here as a Jewish refugee at the age of 16 in 1940, and he joined the Royal Navy. And he used to talk, he didn't talk much about the war, but he used to talk about his time in the Navy. And he said it was about people from all classes, all backgrounds, all walks of life, coming together for a common purpose. That's the way a great company succeeds. I think it's the way great countries succeed as well. Britain faces hard times at the moment. But the only way we come through the storm is with that idea. That idea of responsibility shared among us all. I call that one nation. And that's the future I want to build for this country. Thank you very much. Thank you.